let's go ahead and talk about stem cells. This is a, a fundamental field of bioengineering. It's, um, you know, every bioe department in, in the country has a, a strong regenerative medicine or stem cell component. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty crucial and it's a rapidly changing field. It seems like almost every year the dogma of the previous year is completely wrong and, or completely irrelevant. And so it's, it's kind of hard to, to keep up with. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, it's all pretty exciting. And, and so we're going to go through stem cells and uh, try to get you up to the minute on some of the uh, exciting possibilities. So we're going to talk about what stem cells are, talk about the different types, talk about uses uh, and diseases, you know, not just Parkinson's, but other uh, uh, sort of application domains. But there's some classic examples that really help highlight the uh, problems and the opportunities. OK, so what is a stem cell? Well, this is the basic definition. Uh, it's a non-differentiated non cell that can divide without a fundamental limit, uh, except as imposed by uh, conditions, but it has no intrinsic limit to go through. And it also has the capability of undergoing an asymmetric division. In other words, regenerating itself, regenerating another stem cell, which is fundamental, and also generating a daughter cell that's going to head down a differentiation pathway. And you have a gray zone. Uh, you know, that's, that's the absolute definition. But then you have varying degrees of stemness, OK? So you have cells that um, are still proliferating but have uh, can no longer divide without limits, uh, who themselves are partially differentiated and so can't regenerate a stem cell. So we call them genitors, and we call them uh, uh, also transit amplifying cells, cells that are amplifying a particular uh, branch of the differentiation pathway, but are not yet fully differentiated. And one helpful way to think about stem cells is to how they map onto cells that uh, occur in the course of development. Of course, there are adult stem cells as well that are present in the adult. But uh, in the process of uh, the vertebrate and, and sort of human uh, embryogenesis, we have a process that we've talked about a little bit where you have fertilization, you have in initial cell divisions, and then you have this. Uh, very important cavitation uh, process where you have an inner cell mass, uh, which is asymmetrically localized. And you've got uh, the uh, trophoblast, which is still embryo-derived uh, tissue. But it's going to end up uh, creating uh, sort of support structures rather than embryo proper. It's the cell mass that's going to end up creating the, uh, the embryo. That inner cell mass uh, proliferates. Uh, it's right around here where the zona pellucida that we talked about is uh, ruptured. And it, And then there's implantation in the uterine epithelium, still kind of looking like this. But now you can see these trophoblast cells uh, uh, facilitating the attachment to the uterine uh, Then that inner cell mass differentiates, and it divides into some uh, substructures. Uh, you have uh, the uh, epiblast and the hypoblast. Okay, so there's two types uh, of cells, and they end up forming these two very different kinds of structures. There's a stage at about day 12 called the bilaminar disc. And those end up becoming uh, what's effectively ectoderm. Uh, ectoderm is a lot of the surface uh, structures, skin, also neural tissue, uh, surprisingly. Endoderm ends up being this sort of inner lining of many of your uh, organs. Uh, intestines and so on, and then mesoderm uh, is formed at the interface between those two. That ends up creating a lot of your uh, muscle connective tissue there. You have three fundamental uh, types of tissue, uh, and everything comes uh, from, from those. But all three come from that inner cell mass. Now that, uh, particularly right around here, this is an important stage to think about. This is really the last stage at which uh, cells exist that can make all three of these major uh, kind of class of, of tissue. Uh, but even these cells can no longer make a trophoblast. So there's really uh, there's a distinction between uh, what we call totipotent and what we call a pluripotent. So a totipotent stem cell can make all cell types plus those extra embryonic uh, cells. Okay? And that's prior to the one to three day time frame. So uh, that tends to be not as useful a distinction uh, in terms of practical modern uh, uh, use because we very rarely want to make those uh, extra embryonic tissues. This is the more important bar to hit, which is the pluripotent, making any uh, uh, cell that will correspond to the initial 
those are the cells in the inner cell mass. So those are pluripotent, not totipotent. Um, then, as you go down uh, in differentiation, you become uh, multipotent, which is more restricted. You can make, there are stem cells that can make multiple kinds of cells in a tissue, but not all of them and not all, all tissues. And um, those are present in all kinds of fetal tissues, cord blood, and uh, adult stem cells also correspond to this. And so this is a summary of these principles, and a, a key distinction, uh, uh, embryonic derived stem cells or induced iPS cells, uh, these tend to fall into the uh, pluripotent uh, category. Uh, for a number of years, people struggled with ethical and political issues surrounding embryonic stem cells. Now, although there are other problems, those, those issues are now largely resolved with the uh, advent of iPS technology. There are still problems with how well those cells differentiate, integrate, uh, stop proliferating and so not cause tumors and maintain their differentiated phenotypes. That's also a big issue. Still many challenges, but uh, adult stem cells, less, less uh, options available to them. Uh, they're multipotent, but some advantages, they can be harvested and used uh, quite easily in the same patient without going through a differentiation step. Um, they may have more appropriate, better consolidated, differentiated phenotype than cells that start from here, and have less of a tumor risk as well. And these are used all the time, by the way, for example, in bone marrow uh, transplantation. And in bone marrow transplantation, you have these hematopoietic stem cells, which stand up in lineages uh, that correspond to their blood group. And those are very useful to transplant because you can So uh, this is a useful summary of ectoderm, mesoderm, uh, and endoderm. And actually, there's a fourth category, the germ cells, which end up forming uh, the uh, egg and sperm cells and then the egg and sperm cells. Rise from a little uh, plasma. Um, and so ectoderm, skin cells, neurons, pigments, mesoderm, everything that's kind of in the middle, uh, muscle, heart, uh, uh, cells of the kidney, uh, blood cells, smooth muscle. And Endoderm is uh, a lot of endocrine tissue, pancreatic cells, thyroid cells, and fundamentally different kinds of tissue. It's pretty remarkable that a single cell uh, can make them all. Okay, so let's talk about embryonic stem cells. Uh, these are this uh, everybody who tries to make iPS cells, this uh, exciting technology for which the Nobel Prize was awarded in medicine just uh, just about a year and a half ago. Uh, those uh, um, exist as an attempt to create an embryonic stem cell. It's important to know what is an ESC. Well, it derives from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst. It can really proliferate in a virtually unlimited fashion. It's not bound by this Hayflick limit that's set by telomere shortening. You can maintain these uh, for an arbitrary number of uh, mass. Maintain their chromosomes. They re remain diploid on a good day. Uh, normal uh, complement of chromosomes. And so, you know, how do you how do you know that you have a pluripotent ES cell in the lab? This is a fundamental question. It's very important for people working in the field to, to be able to, to answer that question. How do you know that you have uh, a cell? Well, uh, you know, um, good sort of test that its ability to create all tissues. And so how could you do that? Well, you could maybe do some in vivo tests or you could do some in vitro tests. And so there's different evidence for this. One test is to try to uh, create a uh, in vivo test. And the way you do that is you take some of the cells that you've got in the dish and you inject them uh, into the cavity of a, of a blastocyst. And these are cells that are distinguishable in some way from the host blastocyst into which you're introducing them. So you can see a, a pigment difference. Uh, And uh, so that combined uh, embryo is then transferred into the uterus of a uh, appropriately uh, hormone modified uh, female mouse. And the progeny that result are chimeras. There's the host and then there's the cells that you added. And all you have to do is go through ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and see that the cells that you injected do indeed contribute uh, to all those uh, tissues. So that's really uh, probably the gold standard. There are, it, it gets done less. A lot of people have sort of quick and dirty in vitro tests. 
development look like for various locations. So this chimera generation is a pretty interesting uh, strategy. This basically uh, sort of recapitulates uh, what I've been talking about, and and um, you know to, to actually create these cells that you're going to inject into the recipient breast. Those come from well, those might come from an intercell mass that you've cultured in the laboratory. A couple ways of doing that. For a while, people thought, particularly for human ES cells, that you had to grow them on these computer uh, cells, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, which of course are not very important and created all kinds of safety issues. If you know, if you, you could only maintain human cells if they were growing on mouse cells. What kind of you know, cross-species contamination? But we, people have found that uh, LIF, leukemia inhibitory factor, uh, uh, you don't need, uh, not, not nearly as dependent on the mouse feed as before. And simply just growing LIF can help facilitate the differentiation process and so you get a test in the laboratory. But this is not really a Then you can breed the subsequent uh, chimera. And so then, Depending on, and this is testing really those germ cells, uh, and so you can see, oh, you know, there's both uh, the white and black uh, progeny as well as probably combinations, and so you can actually end up with a, a progeny that are completely generated from a uh, initial uh, transplant. There is another way, uh, yet a third way, not the in vitro differentiation, not the in vivo, but this is a teratoma generation. I saw teratomas. Early on in the course, when we talked about the NMDA receptor dependent uh, psychosis, and that was due to a, effectively a teratoma that was generating uh, abnormal tissues. And that's actually convenient uh, in the experimental setting because uh, you can actually see can a cell that you inject in the in vivo case, can it give rise to cells of all major uh, layers? Can you make Do is you take your yes cells, inject them into uh, adult mice, make the host cells be not, unable to reject these cells as foreign, so you use, uh, and you get these tumors that have hair and teeth and neurons, and so then you actually have a very potent cell. Uh, that works, but really what people do most now, since it's a little less of a controversial field of people Look uh, at your in vitro differentiation. You allow, by changing the growth factors of the medium, you allow differentiation to go down various pathways in the in vivo cardiomyocytes. Okay, let's do a quick test here. Make sure we're on the same page. So, this type of cell is capable of differentiating into any adult mouse. What a potent. Very potent. Uh, most specific answer, I guess, is probably the most restrictive answer in this case. Good. That is indeed correct. It's pluripotent. Uh, it's pluripotent embryonic, while they can make the adult cells as well, they also have this additional capability of extra embryonic cells. Now let's go into the different cell types uh, and let's talk about stem cells that come from tissues. Um, Okay, so um, there's the embryonic cells. You can actually, embryonic stem cells are what we've been talking about most, but then there are these various uh, stem cells that arise from progressively more mature stages of organism uh, life. They have increasingly restricted uh, proliferative and differentiation. Uh, fetal stem cells, you get them from various places, uh, usually from uh, aborted fetuses of various kinds, and those are pretty close. Uh, they, uh, to be able to generate, in many cases, depending on, on where you actually get them and when, can generate uh, the major uh, 
Uh, umbilical cords and placenta, they also have stem cells that appear to be able to at least generate uh, those different uh, germ layers. Two stem cells, iPS cells, we'll talk about these in more detail. Here you start from a mature cell, like a fibroblast from an adult person, and you those end up looking quite a bit like embryonic uh, stem cells. Finally, you have adult cells, which are coming from uh, different cells. So, um, what are they doing there in the adult tissue? Well, they're, they're for a while, in many tissues, they were not known to be present, for example, in the brain. Known to be present, it wasn't clear what their uh, role was. They don't, they're not constantly dividing. So hard to detect for that reason. They're dividing at a very low rate uh, just like you'd see in, <coughs> in tissues that are not uh, engaged in rapid <coughs> uh, regrowth or, or remodeling. But they do regenerate themselves at a low rate and then with the appropriate trigonal, uh, trigger signal, they give rise to uh, uh, progenitor cells. Um, this, there's a lot of interesting complexity here. This looks pretty simple, but that's actually incredibly complex, all these different intermediate steps. So we call those intermediate steps transit amplifying cells. Uh, and they're not differentiated, they're not stem. They're headed down this pathway, they can't go back and make a stem cell, but they're engaged in rapid proliferation and then come and allow them to and people, this is actually quite susceptible and needs modeling, quantitative modeling. Different tissues come up with different answers as to how many steps of this transit amplifying uh, process is needed. And you can imagine tuning that to the, to the tissue. All of these are controllable parameters. The frequency of stem cell division, probability of stem cell death, probability that a stem cell daughter will become a committed progenitor. And you've got cell cycle time of the committed progenitors. And Go through before they can. All these are parameters that are presumably set by different aspects of the biology. And how does you know how does this initially happen? How do you this particular fork is interesting? What uh, does something get handed down to one cell, one daughter cell, but not another? And often that is the case. Um, but sometimes it's it's a environmental cue that creates this asymmetry. And sometimes it appears to be intrinsic, that the cell knows to, to hand off something to one daughter cell but not another. Classic uh, stem cell niches have been characterized where it's pretty clear that there is a uh, direct environmental interaction. Some of those signals that have been looked at are uh, uh, SCF kit interactions and not notch ligand interactions. Stromal cells, these are neither the stem nor the daughter cells, but just support cells in that niche that are providing the signal. So cells that are still sticking to the stromal cell and engaged in these interactions are uh, protected from going down the differentiate or die pathway. Whereas the daughter cell that happens to not be in contact is going to end up uh, going down. In other cases, there are intrinsic uh, factors that don't require. Uh, Let's go through, through some examples of adult stem cells. Where are they? Why are they there? By the way, uh, one thing to think about is these may, in many cases, be uh, sources of cancers. They're proliferating cells that uh, may have long lifetimes, may have a long opportunity to be exposed to uh, environmental. Again, uh, you have this uh, dermis and you have the epidermis um, and do this uh, a non-living uh, uh, but a little deeper in the dermis you have this uh, convoluted structure um, where stem cells tend to reside at the uh, and the differentiation process uh, and the transit amplifying is why these go down to the Trough and then the differentiated cells come out the bottom and then they sort of fountain up uh, over time. It's kind of interesting design. It's not completely clear to me why you have the stem cells more in the middle. Well, um, 
that's how it is. Different uh, configurations are seen in different tissues. Lung, also very exposed. A little more logical, the stem cells are kind of kept uh, down as far away from possible as possible from the uh, environment. You've got your main two types of working cells in the, in the lung. Epithelium are these ciliated cells that uh, are eating, and the mucus goblet cells that are feeding them helps uh, um, transport uh, particulate matter, bacteria. And a single cell, a basal cell, gives a, gives a duck down at the basal lamina. In the intestine, we've got also uh, cells that are, stem cells are sort of more down uh, away from the They are, although that's lining of the intestine is constantly being uh, regenerated, uh, they, the cycle time is not as fast as it could be. Your average mammalian cell will divide you know, in four hours, and these are a little slower than that. And so, um, non dividing uh, population called panocytes. These cells give rise to epithelial cells that move up physically towards the of the epithelial cells from the bottom to the top, and that takes a few days. Then you've got neurons, um, stem cells in different kinds of nervous tissue, especially. Yeah, so they, they get lost up, up here. They, you know, obviously things are in balance. There's not a net accumulation of intestinal lining cells. Why do they get lost? Why do they die? Um, uh, apoptosis is a uh, environmental damage. Um, they, uh, you know, they're, or they're, they're constantly being physically abraded. They're uh, uh, reacting with bacteria and so on. And so they have a, a lot going on. Uh, the reason for this division is presumably to balance that constant loss. It's, it's a very exposed, it's not tough tissue, it's not like your skin where there's a protection. So these cells are really, they're among the most vulnerable in the body. There's constant, you know, physical and chemical uh, infectious trauma hitting them all the time and they're constantly getting That's, uh, that just keeps things in balance. These would, you would categorize as the Different uh, uh, neural tissues do have uh, stem cells. Uh, actually, have in your olfactory epithelium. Uh, believe it or not, this is nobody uh, uh, knows this, uh, totally appreciates this, but there are uh, stem cells factory neurons for your neural tissue. They're also a little bit protected. They're away from the factory uh, epithelial lining. They can give rise to either the support cells or, or the olfactory neurons. When those are born, they start sending their axons down and find their way to uh, olfactory processing. That's you know olfactory, but then as you know, uh, we talked about this before. Even deep within the brain and the hippocampus, you have these neurons that are produced in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. So Similar uh, sort of situation there, and it's kind of a good example to delve into in a little more depth is those cells in the hippocampus. And so they're kind of sparse. You know, you can do different kinds of label. I think I've got a, a good example of um, some of those labels here. So you've got, um, if you, you can label four proliferating cells, uh, and you can do that by using labeled nucleotides that only cells that are generating new DNA will incorporate. And then you can stain for those. So BRDU is one of those. And if you do a BRDU stain in the hippocampus, you can kind of see scattered uh, newborn cells. And then the advantage of the BRDU stain is that sticks with those cells forever. It's a nucleotide, so it's stuck in their DNA. You can stain, you can do a pulse of this labeled nucleotide uh, exposure, and then you can 
follow for the life of the organism, see what those cells are doing. And, you know, initially they start to put out little processes in the first few days, uh, and then in this dentate, this soup-like structure, dentate structure, you can start to see all these little green labeled cells. Um, the counterstain here is red for a protein called double cortin, which is expressed in recurring neurons. And for some of these, foreign cells in green are, are just kind of hanging out. Some of them are co-staining with red. You can see this uh, yellow indicates that the juxtaposition of red and certain newborn cells in the adult that are starting to put out um, processes and express this double cortin or DCX marker. And then if you look uh, about four weeks later, Got your BRDU stain now in white, um, but you can see uh, some uh, quite mature expression of um, uh, processes going out, testing uh, local tissue. Not all of them survive, some die, and they're not all neurons. So as befitting a stem cell, they give rise to some glia. This all they have this uh, short uh, lifespan as well. And so that's, this is a protected population. It's not like the epithelial lining, but there's still a lot of turnover. So in the adult rodent, it's thought that you generate up to 9,000 new neurons per day, about a quarter million per month. Uh, the newborn cells die at a higher rate than the cells that are already there, so it's not as if there's a full change of that much. But probably about 6% of the, of the difference every month, every year. So that's a pretty remarkable shift. Blood, hematopoietic stem cell, though, is where most of the um, fundamentals of uh, human stem cells were sorted out. And the reasons are pretty clear. It's a pretty accessible population. You don't have to delve into tissues. Just take some blood. You know, you're going to do a full doctor's office uh, marrow uh, biopsy. Um, so it's worth focusing on blood just a little bit to, to talk about how that work was done. You've got Multipotent hematopoietic stem cells, um, not pluripotent, multipotent. They can make many types of cells within the hematopoietic stem cell. And there's two main branches, myeloid and lymphoid. Uh, myeloid makes a lot of the white blood cells as well as uh, red blood cells. Um, but it doesn't make the adaptive uh, reforming cells, the T cells. Also, the uh, other cells that contribute uh, to the tree. So, fundamental um, branching of the tree, and so you can see different progression of differentiation steps as you go. So, how do you? So, these were the first and best described stem cells because uh, they're so accessible. So, uh, they reside in the marrow. The hematopoietic stem cells almost always found there. You can actually trigger them to spew out into the uh, bloodstream, which actually is useful clinically if you want to harvest uh, stem cells. But mostly they're residing in the marrow, and actually even within the marrow, they're a very sparse population, and they're probably only percent of the marrow cells. There's a lot of stromal and other parts of the marrow. And, you know, this was uh, tested. Actually, Irv Weissman here at Stanford did a lot of the very fundamental pioneering work. The way you test this is you irradiate a mouse, kill all of its hematopoietic stem cells, wipe out its immune system, and wipe out its blood cells in their entirety. Then you inject in even arbitrarily small amounts of marrow cells from a healthy donor that are labeled. Even you can inject so few that it, it's statistically likely that the animals are getting one or zero. Also, in many cases, will regenerate all of its uh, And what do those look like? Well, they're different in mouse and human. So in mouse, they, they have a lot of this was phenotyped with uh, facts sorting uh, flow cytometry. And so a lot of these are surface markers that were used to sort. They express low to non-zero levels of a phi-1 surface marker that are present in the kit. One and they don't in the human case is a little different. They have the thigh one and the C kit marker, but they have this uh, CD twenty one marker. Uh, Irv also played a, a big role in finding the uh, human. 
stem cells. This is extremely clinically relevant. Uh, happens all the time that we do stem cell transplantation. Um, sometimes it's from the same patient, autologous, sometimes it's from another patient. Uh, and the goal is to replace the hematopoietic system. A lot of cancers, leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, and solid tumors, you'll, the best strategy will be to wipe out everything that's there. And so uh, you do a transplant, uh, and you want to um, then reconstitute that immune system with cells that were previously taken out from that same patient. Some autoimmune diseases, not cancers, but autoimmune diseases, that's the only way to treat them as well. Um, wipe out the immune system that's killing the patient and start fresh. Genetic diseases where you're, you're lacking some key enzymes, so you have an immune system, but it's you have a hematopoietic system, but it's missing something. Um, there are um, you know, some of those where you want to provide a function. It's missing, you might think, well, we don't have to completely wipe out the immune system. Maybe all those are missing. Provide something. Uh, of course, there you run into this question of uh, infection. Is how do you balance those two factors? In fact, that's a much broader field. You know, how do you enable immunologic tolerance uh, for, for uh, stem cell or solid organ cell? So that's that's the concern of these post rejecting the transplant. The problem goes the other way as well. We call this graft versus host disease. If you're transplanting an immune system set of cells, they could attack the host as foreign. And that happens all the time. GHD, graft, graft versus host disease. Um, you know, it's very severe in the skin. You get, um, you get breakdown of the skin even. Uh, it's very acute in the first 100 days, but you're not out of the woods then. There's a all kinds of delayed graft versus host can come on later. Um, seems to be most severe in areas uh, exposed, uh, epithelial and epidermal tissue. Liver actually very susceptible. Uh, cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. Uh, so what do you do? Well, you can give immunosuppressive uh, drugs. People are working on ways to kind of engineer grafts so that you have a lower our susceptibility to GDHD. Um, so you could, for example, deplete T cells prior to transplantation. So you still have, you know, stem cells, progenitor cells, other immune cells, but lack the T cells that would have sort of the memory of what was self and non-self. Of course, there you missed something. This is actually pretty interesting. Um, sometimes you want graft versus host disease. This shows up a lot of times in transplants for uh, for cancers. That actually part of the survival of the patient has been shown to correlate with how bad their graft versus host disease was. And if the worse the GVHD, the better they do. And so people thought, well, maybe that transplanted immune cell tissue is attacking the. So it's always a balance. Uh, you can imagine various uh, strategies, which I think are the natural uh, avenue for people who think about regenerative medicine, bioregenerative medicine. How, how do you train on a cellular level? How do you train the cells to, to attack the host? You know, it's not, it's, so it exists, it's real, it's not that tractable, so it, it's not as if, uh, so, I mean, that's what people are moving toward. That's exactly what you would like to do. You'd like to have a highly purified, precise population that's cancer targeted, that's not going to cause other problems. And that's, and really, in a way, that's exactly the point. But it's just, it's just not quite uh, there yet. We don't know which are the right cells that are cancer targeted, and so do you, do you pan for them and somehow? Is there some affinity marker that would pick those out? And that's, that's really. Um, yeah, so you can do transplants uh, straight into the um, uh, 
uh, the, depending on what you're transplanting, you can transplant it right into the uh, marrow, so you can do an in injection right into the long bones. You can also do it stri into, straight into the bloodstream in, in many cases, but uh, uh, a lot of the transplants are done uh, directly. Right niche to, to source. Um, so, but this is a, a huge area of regenerative medicine, and actually because of the accessibility of hematopoietic stem cells. There's a lot of questions that now people say, okay, you know, given everything we can do with de-differentiating and re-differentiating, uh, we could even, you know, treat other non-hematopoietic uh, problems with appropriately differentiated cells derived from hematopoietic stem cells. And people are doing a lot of interesting things, injecting into hearts after myocardial infarction, um, trying to uh, regenerate the, um, Arterial linings. Um, there's actually some interesting, I mean, it's a little bit controversial. There's clearly data showing, for example, that transplants into the heart after an MI, certainly in animal models, maybe even in some human cases, seem, seem to have a beneficial effect. It's not clear that actually the transplanted cells are turning into heart cells. That's probably not the case, but there's a, but there are a lot of trials in looking at this sort of thing, uh, introducing hematopoietic uh, cells with all kinds of non hematopoietic uh, targets, and is there, is there a de-differentiation, re-differentiation, is there some secretion of growth factors that are helpful, um, and oh, this is not the opportunity is big, so big area of um, cell uh, biomedical research. So what is a potential disadvantage of adult stem cells? compared to embryonic stem cells. Adult stem cells are much smaller and more difficult to handle. Grow too quickly. Cells are difficult to locate or there are no disadvantages. So um, it really has to do with accessibility indeed. So um, they're not smaller or more difficult to handle. They, if anything, they grow more slowly. There certainly are disadvantages. It's really the accessibility. You know, how do you get them out of a brain, for example, if you're interested in regenerating a brain tissue? How do you get them out of a heart? Um, that is changing, but uh, as we identify molecular markers and sorting strategies, uh, but in general, um, and this kind of leads to the next topic is uh, what, how can we uh, use clever differentiation strategies to change this and make uh, adult cells give us the stem cells. So let's talk about embryonic and induced uh, stem cells. So um, initially the classic ES cell lines, uh, they came from the blastocysts, they were the outer cells that formed the placenta, the inner cell mass, and Take away the inner cell mass, that, uh, of course, the, the embryo is no longer viable. Culture cells, uh, and, and with various uh, we known, but you differentiate down different pathways with uh, different growth factors and, and, and the idea is then you just uh, provide those cells to the damaged tissue. Um, and as I indicated, some of these, some of the special sauce actually is known, for example, uh, you can take ES cells, um, and you grow them in the lab, um, have a particular medium that has insulin transparent, and then you put them on a substrate uh, in this medium, and you, some cells start to express this uh, molecule called nestin, which is a cytoskeletal uh, protein that's uh, expressed there. And so you get some cells that express nestin. Okay, and then you can go down different routes. You can provide um, basic uh, FGF and laminin, and you end up making uh, dopamine and serotonin. Uh, have a different subset if you have no laminin, but you give those same things, you end up going down a pancreatic islet cell-like pathway, and you end up create, making cells that create insulin and glucagon. Uh, and then you can go even make dopamine neurons, you know, Tom Jessel's group, he's studied a lot of the growth factors that uh, play a role in 
motor neuron differentiation he's able to make. Back in 2002, he's able to make uh, motor neuron um, cells that uh, transplant it into chicken and give rise to uh, 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 beautiful motor neurons, and these had been derived from mouse PDS cells. You can also use uh, other cells in the neural lineage. Um, so, not neurons, but oligodendrocyte precursor cells. These are the cells that produce myelin, the insulating layer that uh, promotes uh, signal production. And this was a neat strategy in Stanford. This was in the news pretty recently here at Stanford. But it's a neat strategy because you, it's, a, it's a neural stem cell based therapy, but it doesn't require rewiring. It doesn't require injecting cells that have to connect up 10,000 synapses in the right way to do the same thing. Instead, it's a more general, nonspecific cellular based uh, strategy now demyelinating diseases and genetic conditions, autoimmune conditions where the myelin sheath is lost. Transplant oligodendrocyte precursors derived from human embryonic stem cells uh, maybe you could help. And uh, Geron uh, got approval for this in 2009, FDA clearance uh, for phase one. And they actually uh, delivered it to four spinal cord injured uh, patients. Uh, there was, had been some animal studies suggesting but in partial spinal cord injury, that the introduction of OPCs facilitated the recovery of some aspects of function by promoting the function of the connections that were still left. Uh, and it got a lot of a uh, lot of attention. There was no problem. First of all, that was the key thing. Phase one: Are we going to create massive tumors or who knows what? Uh, yeah, but there was no immune rejection, no tumors, no neurological problem. Case was done here. Um, then the trial was pretty abruptly stopped in 2011 due to just they ran out of money, funding problem happened. Uh, this was really uh, uh, patients are going to be followed. There's enough money around to follow the patients for a number of years. So this was a frustrating thing that happened, but it, it was nice that there was no uh, frank uh, complication. People are looking at ESL derived uh, you know, trials for macular degeneration. Again, we have sort of safety, but not really uh, uh, effic efficacy data that uh, is reproducing. Okay, so that's Frank uh, ESL, human ESL work. There's all kinds of new and improved versions of this. Uh, for a while, people talked about somatic cell nuclear transplantation. The idea was how can we start with a fully mature person and Maybe what we could do is take the nucleus out of like a some skin cell from that person. We could put that nucleus into a donor oocyte or something like that, and maybe we could make get the a blastocyst, get the cell mass, and then make a lot of that patient specific if they have the same nucleus as the adult patient's uh, cells, but uh, so they have the same genotype. But we could make any kinds of cells that we wanted. Uh, people who proposed this always had to make clear, although the principle was always there. The idea was, well, you could also do, if you're doing that, you could also do reproductive cloning. You could clone a person, and they always had to say, no, no, we're not doing that. Oxygen, trying to clarify that was the case. Um, said the goal was to make uh, cells that you could then transplant. But people did clone, of course, other uh, organisms, uh, even multiply clone, which was a clone of actual cool. Um, so see that. Uh, Aroused a lot of interest, uh, but <clears throat> um, it's pretty simple. You know, it's a it, you first you enucleate the recipient oocyte held by the kind of glass pipe path that we've already talked about, and you go ahead and inject in, uh, you know, the new. You actually, even inject an entire cell or there. And in some cases, if you've done everything right, you can go ahead and make uh, cells. But people worried also about not just the reproductive cloning aspect; they were worried. Uh, while well, you're destroying embryos to make this uh, happen if you're working with people. And so a lot of people struggled with this. Uh, Yanish and his colleagues came up with a strategy where they said, well, let's, let's make uh, the embryo um, unable to uh, progress down the differentiation pathway. Let's have it lack this particular tube that's required for ectoderm. So its inner cell mass is in theory all normal, but it can't be an embryo. Then it's okay to kill it. But a lot of people, even people who are strong supporters of uh, ESL work, said this is stupid. It's a lot of trouble for, for no real reason.
reason, and who knows what else you're going to problem you're going to cause uh, with the embryo bite. Um, so, sake of time, I'm just going to go get right to induced stem cells. So here, this is a <clears throat> uh, this guy was a guy who got the Nobel along with John Gurdon a year and a half ago, and what he figured out was how to uh, just de-differentiate mature adult cells uh, into guest cell like um, populations, and, and we call these IPS cells. And uh, the idea here is pretty simple: just take the cells out with a biopsy from from the patient, add reprogramming factors look like uh, embryonic stem cells and go ahead and just tissue cells. Now it's an interesting paper. Uh, that, that initial paper that led to the Nobel had some, both some complications uh, uh, and uh, some sort of complexities that people are still struggling with. For example, they were one of the so-called Yamanaka factors, these four uh, de-differentiation factors included uh, an oncogene uh, uh, mix, emic. And so there's a question of, well, you know, we may be making yes cells, but are we making cells that have successful tumors? And that still is an open question. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, they had relatively specific human cell sources. There was facial dermis and uh, there was a, a foreskin application. And the question is how generalizable is this going to be? It's now worked in a broad range of cases, so that's less of a concern. People are still curious about exactly what's going on. The other factors, and uh, SOX2 uh, uh, aspects of the Yamanaka factors, which people still use. Uh, you know, what is the molecular mechanism by which they act? There was this other one, score, which may be less important. And so there's an active area of research uh, in sorting all that. Then, um, you know, the, the, there's actually an interesting question. Um, if your target tissue is, are you, are you de-differentiating just regular skin cells, or maybe there were stem cells in that tissue that are actually the, what you're looking for. So that is still sort of being uh, sorted out. And people had, there was some skepticism until everybody kind of got this working. Uh, part of it is that people had this idea that cells kind of get into this uh, fixed differentiation pathway where there's an epigenetic DNA modification that's covalent, it's very extensive, where Histones are methylated, where there's a very dense chromatin structure, and it was unclear how just adding a few factors would completely reverse all of this. And a lot of this thinking, and these are some slides borrowed from uh, Marius Wernig uh, here at Stanford. He's done a lot of work. Am I bumping it? Sorry about that. I, anybody about to have a seizure? <clears throat> well, look away if you're getting nauseous. That's all I can say. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't actually seen that before. We'll try to make it through. People had this idea that <clears throat> that you kind of got this, this, this so-called Waddington epigenetic landscape, that there was sort of this uh, <clears throat> uh, way of thinking about cell differentiation where cells progress down pathways and they kind of end up uh, uh, stuck in valleys that it's very difficult to get back from. You can't get over to another type. But people said, well, you know, even using this um, topological analogy, is there some way to kind of get them partway back up? and, and People said, well, maybe, you know, if this is all relating to something physical and molecular, we could de, you know, demethylate chromatin, we could uh, change epigenetic factors. And, and so this is a, an active area of research to exactly what's uh, going on. But I want to spend a little bit of time on what Marius uh, uh, has done. So he figured out even uh, simpler ways of getting to uh, target uh, tissues uh, from uh, adult he, he had a particular focus on neurons, so he called this the IN strategy, induced neural cells. And so he would take even tail tip fibroblasts uh, and just grow them in the laboratory, so just from the tail. He could also do this from embryonic uh, as well as from postnatal. And he found that uh, with adding a few transcription factors, I guess the Wernig factors, uh, you'd call them, 
he could actually make uh, neurons from these skin cells, skin cell tissue, but that's without even going through an embryonic stem cell, or at least a known embryonic stem cell. And uh, so that was kind of interesting. So the ion cells express these neural cytoskeletal markers, uh, two one, and these uh, description factors, mu n, uh, and sir, cytoskeletal proteins, MAP2. They express neurotransmitters. They had action potentials. They formed synapses. You could see spontaneous currents that were blocked by the right antagonist. Fast, so it only took a couple weeks to take them. And got them also from uh, hepatocytes, from endoderm instead of from cells in the BAM factor. Make ion cells uh, by action. Did it from human. He and uh, um, in that case, uh, a lot of these things are pretty interesting. Uh, he's class uh, as well. Um, functionally active human induced neural cells. So interesting possibilities here. You can imagine not only for regenerative processes, but also. We're just studying what's wrong in a neurological or psychiatric disease that might be genetic. Uh, you know, taking someone's skin cells and then studying their neurons. Right now, you know, without that, I'd have no way to you know study your neurons particularly. But now, I'm thinking we could take some uh, you know, fibroblasts, turn them into neurons, and then study their process. Of course, there are some problems with this. It's not actually clear, completely clear. This is a viable strategy. You can imagine there's going to be a lot of variability in how well different you know, within a population, some cells are going to. Differentiate, differentiate to varying extents, and so they're going to have different levels of sodium channels, and that's going to be time varying depending on how long you are in culture and, and so on. So if if the genetic defect is due to a 20 percent you know down regulation of the sodium channel, that's going to be pretty hard, I would think, to pick up in this sort of assay. People still have a lot of hope for this kind of thing, and so there's a lot of uh, effort uh, going into this, and so. Together, the sort of a contrast between IN and ITS cells. The IN is faster. Uh, he says it's robust and reproducible, uh, relatively homogeneous population, uh, and easy to generate for many individuals. The problem with ITS is he's got to go through this you know, stage, and so it's a little slow. And um, and so he's working on ways of uh, combining the different strategies. So, but let, let's talk about time scale because that's actually. And if you really are serious about this, about actually making therapies, then you've got to not only think about timing, but pick a disease where it makes sense. And then you've got to think about what, where are all these cells at these different time points? So we're going to put this back into a patient, so where, where are we doing all this? Probably not on a bench, you know, in a lab here in, in a loci, for example. So what exactly is going on? Where is that being done? But here is what the time scales look like. You've got a couple weeks, take them out from the patient. You can make uh, fibroblasts as a traditional ITS. Eight weeks to make colonies, another four to six weeks to make ITS lines. Just as Dave mentioned, so that actually is going to take a while. So this is um, you know, a little bit difficult. So what Marius is interested in is shortcutting things, you know, going uh, you know, straight from fibroblasts to, to uh, functional neurons, for example. So um, I want to close with, I want to make sure we get to the case study in time. So I just want to go back to something we talked about a little bit earlier, which is Parkinson's, and then we'll get to the case study. So Parkinson's has long, you know, people have long looked at this as a classic strategy for stem cell derived neuron transplantation. We know the neurons that are missing. So we, in theory, we know how to reproduce them. But there's a lot of questions, you know, first of all, how do we make the dopamine neurons uh, from ESLs, for example. How do we deal with immune rejection? And then this very general question, how do we just have to connect up in the right three-dimensional pattern? And so, you know, let's think about Parkinson's for the moment, but then think about, okay, how is all this going to be dealt with and where, in what context are we going to be uh, producing these cells? And so there's this whole subfield of stem cell biomanufacturing. Um, different academic centers have. Uh, GMP facilities, good manufacturing practice facilities that are set up to uh, process clinically transplantable cell populations. And there's a whole special workflow that they worry about. Uh, there's clean rooms, uh, you know, parts per million of uh, uh, 
uh, in, uh, particles that are tolerated at different points along the progression from dirty to clean, clean to dirty, and then uh, how do you test your sample for adventitious pathogens? What do you test for? How much of your medium do you test? You know, if you're, you're testing 1% of it, uh, what are you likely to be missing and so on? So there's a whole set of quality control calculations that are involved. Um, and FDA has uh, policies uh, that regulate quality control. Okay, so let's say though that you get to the end and you have stem cells that you could transplant. So what would you do? Well, Parkinson's, just to remind you, you've got this degeneration of the substantial nigra. Um, these are cells that project two striatum. So you could inject, your, let's say you made dopamine neurons or we'll get them from human uh, fetal brain cells or let's say you derive them from human embryonic cells, make dopamine neurons in the lab. What are you going to do? Are you going to inject them into the substantia nigra where they normally live? Or are you going to inject them into their projection target, the striatum, where they normally project to? That's an initial question. I don't know what, what you all think. Um, how many people say substantia nigra? Everybody's gone into striatum, and that's basically this strategy. So you, you go ahead and you get your precursor cells, you make dopamine neurons. People have tried this in rodents, seems to work. People haven't yet done this in, in human, but what they have done in human is take human fetal dopamine neurons as kind of a test bed, okay? That has complications with the, the supply, supply and demand. You've got a million uh, people with Parkinson's and you don't really have that supply of human fetal dopamine uh, neurons. Um, so maybe if we could show that it works, then we could map on our, IP, you know, some kind of guest cell strategy on top of that. So people have gone ahead and in, introduced the human fetal drive cells in human uh, and introduced them into the stratum. And, but people have also worked very hard on generation of the cells uh, uh, from embryonic stem cells. It's definitely possible now to make unlimited human dopamine neurons from human embryonic stem cells. We express all the right markers uh, and um, dopamine release competence. But basic transplantation of the fetal neurons, which you have to get that right before you did the ES cell derived stem cells. At least see if we get things working right if we put the dopamine neurons in. Generally failed. So a couple big sham <coughs> surgery trials were done. Uh, three tested this and there were side effects. Um, Two patients that were clearly benefiting, but on a population level, it didn't work. So, but people are working on uh, improving this. It's an active area of research. It's really a, a fundamental bioengineering problem. You know, why is it not working? Are, are you injecting in some clot of cells where most of them are dying and they don't have access to the tissue? If we disperse the cells better, would that be relevant? If, are they dying after transplant? Do we have to provide growth factors? We have to guide their axons or dendrites in the right way. Do we have to provide activity training? This is a huge, very exciting area. We can make the cells now. We just uh, have to consider what to do with them once they're made. Okay, so that's stem cells. Any questions on stem cells? Um, next year, the lecture's gonna be completely different, I'm sure, so we'll see. We'll see. Okay, so let's talk about a case. Chief complaint, fever. Ms. P brings in her five-year-old son, Jacob, who's had a fever intermittently for several weeks. First worried about an infection, but Jacob didn't complain of any usual symptoms of infection. Symptoms persisted even after a course of antibiotics that was prescribed in the care clinic. More recently, complaints about his bones hurting and painful lumps in his groin. So, with this limited information, what might be primary cause of the persistent symptoms. I'll tell you what each of these are.
So aplastic anemia, that is complete failure of production of uh, uh, blood cells. Uh, so loss of the hematopoietic lineage, and you have no red blood cells. Also, that can arise spontaneously. It uh, can be toxin-induced. This is growing pains, musculoskeletal changes of childhood. Things grow, shift, grow at different rates. You get Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, this is an inflammatory condition, attacks joints and bones and can cause blisters and uh, or infection, osteomyelitis, frank actual uh, infection of the bones, and that can happen. Leukemia, you have a cancer based proliferation of a particular type. Be a more general infection, not a specific of bone, but indeed a virus, and so that would explain why the antibiotic hadn't been uh, effective. Um, bacterial, why was the antibiotic not effective? Well, it's the wrong one. Thousand by proxy, who knows what this is? People, does anyone know what Munchausen syndrome is? Yeah, how about Munchausen? So the Munchausen syndrome by proxy is fascinating. It's, you see this in uh, the hospital a lot. Munchausen syndrome is when someone has, it's sort of both disease and deception. There is no frank disease, but there's a, a sort of a psychiatric disease and, and people uh, cause disease symptoms in themselves. So they, they'll maintain a fever, for example, by injecting in uh, some of their own feces into their own bloodstream, for example. So you see that, uh, not uncommon. Enough that large studies have been written about it, and you know, it shows up at every major center at least every couple of years. And so it, it, that's okay. So that's that's confusing enough. But then, when it's a kid, it's by proxy, and that means it's the kid's fine, but it's the parent or a caregiver who's doing that, and that happens a lot too. So it's not as common as like a, a common cold, but it, yeah. Why did why do people do it? You know, that's a deep question. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the Munchausen syndrome itself, some people, they adapt to the sick role. They kind of need it for various reasons. Uh, it's, it's a psychiatric illness. It's a, a problem where they may have a delusion that they need to bear the sick role or they become dependent on it. It's really unshakable. They cause immense damage to themselves. Um, it's not suicide. They're not trying to kill themselves, but they have developed a, a psychological dependence on this. Years of psychiatry, and then by proxy, you know, that the, the, some parents or caregivers, they, their role in life is very tightly linked to their children's illness, uh, and very sad. Uh, but it happens. Um, yeah, for the sake of so actually, let's why don't we just do a show of hands? Actually, plastic anemia, growing pains, idiopathic arthritis, colitis, anemia, viral infection, bacterial. <coughs> Thousand by proxy. All right, so I'll give you a little more history. Child was born full term, 40 weeks, nothing wrong, uh, no complications, fully immunized, no prior surgeries or hospitalization, no history of anything actually alternating for fever. This is mother and father, goes to preschool, developmentally appropriate. What does he look like on physical exam? Heart rate, a little elevated. Blood pressure a little bit for a kid too, not too bad. Respiratory rate, pretty normal. Pulse oximetry, 97% on EMA. Low grade fever. Child, young child, skinny, appears uncomfortable. Best. Breathing is unlabored, lungs clear to auscultation bilaterally, so you can't pick up any crackling or wheezing. 
part, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, gallops, no abdomen, soft, non tender to palpation, non distended, lymph nodes, something. Firm, non tender lymphadenopathy, not painful, but you can feel it. Palpate in the groin, axilla, and cervical, ranging size from 8 to 15 nanometers. Skin, fair but with petechiae, which are these small red spots all over. Here is your task. Based on the symptoms, come up with a rank list. Right now, many things could be going on. You know, at this stage, there's not a single right answer. Got to start testing for things, looking at things. Use the various organizational frameworks we've talked about to guide your thinking. Give very brief justification, as we've talked about. This is supposed to be short. Very briefly, suggest some tests and how they can help you differentiate. Okay. 